How should government and business leaders be proactive in protecting their supply chains from another crisis? I'm Edward Siegel, a leadership strategy senior contributor for Forbes.com and author of the best-selling and award-winning book, Crisis Ahead, 101 Ways to Prepare for and Bounce Back from Disasters, Scandals, and Other Emergencies. My guest today is Brian Alster. He is the General Manager of the North America Finance and Risk and Enterprise Platform Businesses at Dun & Bradstreet. Today, he'll share his insights, perspectives, and recommendations about urgent supply chain-related issues. Well, thanks for joining me today, Brian. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Uh, Tell me, how significant a threat are disruptions to supply chains today? Uh, Pretty significant. You know, companies have had a barrage of disruptions over the last three years, and really companies of all shapes and sizes have, have been negatively impacted. Um, you know, there, there are the, the large impacts that, that have been well documented, like COVID, the impacts of the longstanding pandemic, uh, the invasion of Russia's, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, climate events globally. But there are others that are, are continuing to have challenges, such as you know, the rising labor costs, there's a lot of strike, there's been a lot of strikes um, or threats of strikes at mo- major global shipping ports um, around the world. And so these continue to have an impact and one after the other creates a compounding impact. So you name it and companies have likely been impacted by it over the last three years. Well, speaking of Ukraine, uh, Russia's war against Ukraine is now in its second year. Uh, what impact has the war had on supply chains around the world? Yeah, the ripple effect has extended far beyond Russia and Ukraine. Um, It's caused an increase in prices of several types of commodities, whether it's fertilizers, food products such as grain and barley, um, as well as oil and gas continue to have impacts. Um, The supply chain disruptions have also created increases in freight charges. um, And there's been some short term um, impacts in in shortages in different types of containers in the region as well. So, um, you know, a year into this uh, invasion, and I would say that the impacts are still quite, um, quite widely felt. How well did government agencies and the private sector respond to those disruptions? You know, I, I think private sector responded um, as well as can be expected. You know, coming on the heels of other disruptions, um, companies have been playing a little bit more off of their front foot, which is great to see. Um, but we still continue to see impacts from increases in prices of food, um, oil and gas. And as a result of that, you know, they can they can react, but it's hard to truly eliminate and mitigate the risks. So overall, I think that companies have done a pretty good job of trying to adapt and work around them. But as I mentioned earlier, the compounding impact of all of the um, disruptions has really created a challenge for companies especially those on a smaller scale. Can you talk a little bit more about what those uh, challenges are and the lessons that we should learn from how companies uh, responded uh, to the last crisis? Yeah, absolutely. In terms of challenges, I think first and foremost, it's just um, an increase in the prices that we've seen from uh, multiple companies of all shapes and sizes, both big and small. They they can't continue to pass price increases on to the customers because at some point supply and demand um, will invert the curve and customers will no longer be buying once prices reach a certain level. Uh, and so we're starting to see um, companies having to figure out how to creatively reduce costs without having to pass dollar for dollar costs onto the customer. That's one. Two, um, they've had to make do with with shortages. Um, and, and those shortages have, have definitely impacted their ability to turn the raw materials into, into goods that they can sell. Um, so we, we have seen impacts um, across the board. In terms of what companies can do to respond, I think first and foremost, having a really strong vendor management program that has two aspects to it. One, uh, continuous monitoring to see and understand how f- concepts like geopolitical risk, uh, sanctions risk could have an impact on their, on their supply chain and their end products. Um, when they can play off their, their front foot a little bit more and be a little bit more proactive, they tend to be able to mitigate the risks quicker and to identify these challenges before they actually hit. Um, the second is 
having a really, really um, effective uh, process for alternative suppliers, right? And so we've seen a shift from uh, it, uh, globalization of the supply chain to certain critical components trying to nearshore or onshore. And we are seeing companies to do that a little bit more effectively coming out of um, Russia and Ukraine um, conflict. Um, we're also seeing it from other challenges around uh, the pandemic and um, other, other uh, challenges around the world um, that these companies have had to deal with. So uh, alternative suppliers and having a strong ongoing monitoring program that proactively identifies risks before they happen. You mentioned the importance of being proactive. Uh, how should businesses and government leaders be proactive when thinking about how to protect their supply chains from future disruptions? It's a really good question. I think there's three key steps. One, illuminate your supply chain and truly understand what uh, your most critical suppliers are. So a company might have thousands of suppliers, but only 10% of them might be their most critical or single points of failure. So number one, make sure you have a really strong understanding of your supply chain. Number two, identify the potential risks before they happen. If you're continuously monitoring for geopolitical risk and you see um, or, or start to understand um, the impacts of like Russia's invasion that we just talked about on Ukraine, understanding that and the companies and the suppliers that you have in that region, you could start to understand that there might be risks there and how you can circumvent those risks or um, mitigate them before it happens. So as you know, with the pandemic is a great example. With the pandemic, customers were calling us in March of 2020 and asking how can Dun & Bradstreet help to identify the potential risks of all these shutdowns in, in China and different parts of the world and we were able to, over the course of a couple of weeks, be able to show companies all the different com uh, sub-tier suppliers that they had in that region. And that while they didn't feel the impacts yet because they still had goods and services um, from their existing supply chain, either in route or in their warehouses, we knew that they were going to feel the impact of it. So being able to identify proactively what's going to happen four to six weeks down the line or a couple months down the line gives you the ability to react quicker and identify alternative suppliers or identify nearshoring opportunities to circumvent or to mitigate that risk. And then the third um, component, which is equally important, is don't stop once you've identified a solution. Uh, continue to create a process that allows for ongoing monitoring so that you're not surprised the next time an event happens. Having ongoing monitoring means that you're continuously seeing whether or not those most critical suppliers could potentially pose a risk um, due to some macroeconomic envi or environmental issue. When it comes to dealing with a supply chain crisis, does size matter? Does the size of a company or an organization impact how it will be affected by a supply chain disruption and what it can do to prepare for it? Absolutely. Size absolutely matters in this instance. You know, as we've seen throughout time, small businesses are typically the first types of companies impacted um, negatively and the last ones to be able to recover from those challenges. Um, when you compound the fact with, um, you know, over 80% of, of companies in the world are made up of small businesses, that means that small businesses around the world are impacted at a much larger rate. They don't have the price um, flexibility to be able to utilize their size and pricing power to be able to negotiate lower costs. This means that when larger companies are being able to reduce costs elsewhere without passing them on to customers, smaller companies have far more challenges with that. So they, they don't have as many options or tools in their toolbox to be able to mitigate or offset expenses elsewhere when their costs go up. Additionally, small businesses are, are dealing with um, wage increases at a much higher rate than what you're seeing um, larger companies deal with. Um, these increases have a much larger or profound impact 
on small businesses because of the increase or just the sheer amount of money that they put into their labor costs as a percentage of their total expenses. So another challenge for small businesses. Lastly, I think that what we're seeing around um, the ability for companies to invest in data and technology to help identify alternative suppliers and to proactively identify issues before they happen, smaller companies don't have the um, ability to invest in these resources as easily. And so they have a, a double-edged sword. They can't invest in these resources, therefore they can't benefit from the capabilities. And as a result of that, that compounding impact of having fewer areas to uh, reduce their costs, having rising costs um, as a larger percent of their total overhead, and then three, not having the ability to react as fast because they don't have um, the investments necessary, makes it a much more challenging for small businesses than larger businesses. I will add one additional challenge is how global you are. Um, usually having a global footprint creates the ability to, um, to, to react and, how, and to pivot. But in this case, with the supply chain disruptions we're seeing, sometimes being near shore um, may have a, uh, a, better in, a better outcome for customers and for businesses of all shapes and sizes. But as a smaller company, if you have a diverse supply chain that is, does require some multinational supply chains, that makes it even harder for them to pivot and identify um, alternatives. So really small businesses, it definitely matters um, in, in this environment that they're impacted at significantly higher rates than larger companies. It doesn't mean that larger companies aren't impacted, just the size of the impact is what really hurts. Well, Brian, because of the difference of size that some companies and organizations may have, uh, is there any difference in how they should be planning and accounting for their size in their crisis management plan uh, or how they're practicing for a supply chain disruption um, when they're doing their exercises and drills? Yeah, um, it's actually a unique challenge right now. We're seeing more and more companies, especially larger companies, wanting to diversify their supply chains and to help the communities around them by identifying uh, small businesses that are diverse for a variety of reasons, including women-owned, minority-owned, um, economically disadvantaged companies, and being able to identify them and bring them into their supply chains. That's a great opportunity, but when you understand that smaller businesses tend to have a much, um, uh, tend to be impacted more greatly from supply chain disruptions, it means that as company larger companies are bringing um, these smaller businesses into their supply chain, they need to make sure they're doing the diligence to understand how the disruptions could impact them and their sub-tier supply chains. So going forward, how does Dun & Bradstreet prepare its clients for this type of crisis? Uh, so Dun & Bradstreet has really been focused on making sure that customers understand the value of spending the time up front to do a proper diligence of on while onboarding new suppliers. It's really important to have a well-rounded understanding, not just of the traditional credit risk and operational risk and supplier uh, risks, but also to understand impacts of geopolitical events, understanding um, uh, potential for sanctions and watch lists and making sure uh, that companies are doing a, do a strong diligence on understanding not just the companies that they're doing business with, but also the owners associated with those companies to identify whether or not risks exist. Uh, another great uh, uh, challenge that customers have had to be dealing with recently is the increase in the need for um, environmental and sustainability governance um, uh, checks to make sure that companies that they're doing business with don't put them at risk from a reputation perspective because of poor judgment associated with ESG uh, programs. So it's really important that companies continue to try and identify and do business with companies that are like-minded, being able to see that data while you're onboarding those customers is cr or those companies is absolutely critical. You just mentioned ESG programs. For our listeners who are not familiar with that term, uh, 
what are the, what are those programs briefly? Yeah, so you know, there's a ESG continues to be a hot topic globally for most, if not all, industries um, that Dun and Bradstreet works with. Uh, really, it's making sure from an environmental perspective, from a sustainability perspective, and from a risk governments perspective, uh, making sure that your suppliers are doing business the way that you would expect to do business and that they don't create any kind of reputation risks or um, some downstream impacts associated with how they're conducting business that would negatively impact um, your company associated with uh, whether it's um, lab poor labor practices, poor cyber risk practices, um, uh, a lack of concern for environment. Those impacts can have a large ramification to companies that use suppliers that don't have strong ESG programs. Some risk factors, of course, can be controlled or mitigated, while others never can. What are some of the examples of the potential risks to supply chains that have become a reality? One of the ones we're seeing play out um, over the last year are the new sanctions as a result of geopolitical issues. You know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine caused dozens of individuals and companies to be sanctioned nearly overnight. It means that thousands of companies doing business with um, these sanctioned companies, they were working with them in January of 22 with no challenges. And then as of April of 22, they could no longer do business with them. And so because these new companies and new individuals were added to the sanctions list um, over the course of those first few months of the, of the uh, invasion, companies had to, around the world had to react and identify alternative uh, suppliers in order to do business with them. So new sanctions as a result of geopolitical issues is a real great example. Another, if, if you don't mind, are disruptions due to labor strikes. Um, the threat of strikes can be a disruption as well. We saw this in ports throughout Europe, on the coasts of the United States. Um, companies now need to consider the idea of onshoring or nearshoring to offset these risks. Um, and this is a challenge because historically, they, they considered holding of inventory to be frowned upon due to the higher holding costs. But now those higher holding costs may actually be less expensive um, to offset than what you would see by trying to identify alternative suppliers uh, real time. So it's a bottom line issue. What's uh, going to be more costly to, to a company, whether they do something about it or if they don't? That's right. It's a matter of being proactive at a slightly higher cost or being reactive at a potentially much worse cost. Brian, what trends do you see now that can make disruptions to the supply chain even more likely? Wow, I'd say due to the significant challenges that companies have endured over the last two or three years, there's so much stress in the system. So now even a small localized event, like a weather event, it could have a much larger ripple effect because of the fragility of the cause that's been caused by the, the multiplier effect of the ongoing disruptions. Uh, we're seeing in businesses that are smaller, uh, they're having a much tougher time reacting to these uh, smaller localized events. It could be an increase in uh, specific costs of, of certain goods um, that, may, may, that, that price increase might be localized. And so having to find alternatives is becoming harder and harder. And so uh, I would say that the biggest challenge right now is that the system can't handle that many more significant impacts um, and supply chain disruptions because of the multiplier effect of all the, the, the impacts that have happened over the last three years. What about trying to look a little bit over the horizon to what the challenges may be uh, tomorrow or in the months or years to come? Uh, what are those challenges that government agencies in the private sector are facing when they're trying to uh, project or forecast uh, another supply chain crisis? Oh, uh, wow. Well, in the near term horizon, I think rising costs are having a huge issue. Um, the, the, the challenge that companies are facing from uh, shortages or an increase in costs due to, um, um, you know, we, we, we talked about um, oil and gas, but 
We know that there were chip shortages um, that companies have had to deal with over the last year. I, I don't foresee that going away in the near term. So companies are going to have to figure out how to cut costs elsewhere um, or to con continue to pass costs on to their customers in order to offset these challenges. I think that's going to be the number one challenge that companies are going to have over the next year um, horizon in having to deal with some of these supply chain disruptions. Preparations are key, of course, in getting ready for the next crisis. Uh, how can companies and organizations help ensure that they are as ready as possible for another supply chain crisis? Yeah, I would say that there's the, the key here is really to ensure that they have a strong supplier or vendor management process. Uh, they need to have three components to their supplier onboarding process. One, a complete risk assessment that includes, as we mentioned earlier, not just your prototypical um, credit and financial health, um, their ability to deliver, uh, but also looking at a supplier's ability to react to geopolitical events, to ability to um, assess their cyber readiness, to assess their ESG policies, to understand how um, they're conducting business and to ensure it's does, done in a way that doesn't impact your company. Uh, number two is making sure that you don't just do the initial assessment and put it in the drawer and wait until the next renewal of that in organization. You have to do ongoing continuous monitoring to understand how changes in the macro environment could impact the risk of a company that historically may not have posed a risk. We talked about examples of that with sanctions, uh, with uh, the uh, weather events, the, sh the uh, needs to onshore because of challenges in, in labor costs. All these have to be understood and understand in real time how those changes in the macro environment are actually impacting um, one's ability to deliver on their goods to a company. And then the last is really have a strong process that proactively identifies these risks so that you're, you're never going to be able to be completely proactive, but being able to react quickly is imperative. And companies cannot spend months trying to figure out how they react to, a, uh, to an event. They have to be able to quickly, near real time, be able to pivot and mitigate risk as quickly as possible to impact, to have the, 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 the smallest amount of impact on their bottom line as possible. I'm afraid we're almost out of time today, uh, but what's the most important message you'd like people to take away from our conversation? I would say be proactive. Utilize third parties like Dun & Bradstreet to automate data collection on, on your suppliers. Be diligent when onboarding vendors. Don't cut corners, but make sure that you're doing a full risk assessment. You know, many of the... Um, the roles that, that are responsible for third-party risk management, whether that be procurement, um, third-party risk, uh, compliance, spending the time and the energy up front will pay huge dividends, especially as these organizations are being asked to help improve revenue and, and profitability. The way they do that is by making sure their assessments are sound, that they are automating them so that they can do them faster without cutting corners, and then have a continuous monitoring program that's built on technology to do it for them so that they can continue to be fast in how they are seeing, identifying, and responding to events that happen around the world to create disruption. Well, thanks for joining us today, Brian. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. That's it for this edition of Crisis Ahead. My guest today was Brian Alster, the General Manager of the North America Finance and Risk and Enterprise Platform Businesses at Dun & Bradstreet. Be sure to come back next week for more advice and insights on preparing for, managing, and recovering from a crisis, or subscribe to Crisis Ahead wherever you get podcasts. Remember, it's not a matter of if a crisis will hit your organization or company, it's when, and the sooner you are prepared for it, the better. Produced by HeartCast Media.